consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise as we join together in the singing of our intro printed in your worship.
The Old Testament reading for this Sunday is from the book of Habakkuk, chapters 1 and 2. The prophet Habakkuk writes, The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you look idly, look, and wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower, and look out to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he who may run, who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time, it hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it, it will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him. The righteous shall live by his faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join with me as we begin this month of October with the seventh petition and its meaning. But deliver us from evil. What does this mean? We pray in this petition, in summary, that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil of body and soul, possessions and reputations, and finally, when our last hour comes, give us a blessed end, and graciously take us from this valley of sorrow to himself in heaven. The epistle reading is from St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, the first chapter. St. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure it dwells in you as well. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, 
which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit of not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and that which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern and the sound words that you have heard from me, and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and he were cast into the sea, than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in, in from the field, Come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, and dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again from 
according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, who his kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our hymn of the day.
growing up in the city of Lystra must not have been easy for Timothy as a Jew. We know Lystra was a fairly sizable city of the Roman Empire. In living amongst the pagans, there was, according to history, no synagogue for young Timothy and for his mother and grandmother to attend on Saturdays. Imagine walking the streets of Lystra for a moment, not finding strip malls with restaurants and cookie shops, sports stores, and stores of all goods. But imagine walking the narrow streets of Lystra with the shrines and the temples the Roman and Greek gods built up on either side of you. In between finding the shops and the places where the buying and selling took place, those shrines would have been attractive to young eyes. They promised knowledge, they promised wealth, they promised freedom. Yes, many of them would have contained statues of Zeus and Hermes, but in all actuality, the gods that would have attracted young Timothy would have been the coinage of this Roman city. The flesh of the body and the longing for more and better than his neighbors. Timothy was probably much on his own. Most likely there weren't many other Jewish boys Timothy's age. And it must have been difficult for Timothy being different from the pagan children that he rubbed shoulders with on a daily basis. And though Timothy was uncircumcised, he was probably also made fun of for the way that he ate. For the fact that Lois and Eunice wouldn't let him come out on Saturdays to play with his friends and run around the streets of Lystra. And for worshiping a God who claimed exclusive rights to salvation. If you thought life was rough in town, some of you probably don't have to imagine what life may have been like in the home of Timothy. His father, who goes unnamed throughout the scriptures, we know is a Greek. He was an unbeliever. We don't know if Eunice and Lois had tried to share their faith with Timothy's father. But I think it's okay to say that they may have, and that they probably did. At least by the way they lived their lives, keeping the Jewish dietary laws, their strict observance of the Sabbath, reading the Torah, and offering up their prayers on a daily basis, I'm sure that Timothy's father wouldn't have been wholly exposed to the faith that they believed in. The father of Timothy remained sad in his ways. And I'm sure that there were days when Timothy asked his mom and his grandmother, why does dad get to eat bacon and I don't? Why does dad get to stay home on the Sabbath day and put his feet up and enjoy the Lions game as they play the Seahawks, and you're going to make me have to go to the synagogue, or at least over to somebody else's house to spend time with in the Torah. But it is interesting. Though the law required Timothy to be circumcised, Lois was still respectful of her husband. She kept the Sixth Commandment, but she didn't have Timothy circumcised. 
The news spread like wildfire one day through the city of Lystra. The news that Hermes and Zeus had healed a man who had been lame from birth. But these were no gods. These were two missionaries by the name of Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, I'm sure, would have attracted the small contingent of Jews who were living in Lystra by their reputation and their preaching that had preceded them. And so, I'm sure, Lois and Eunice would have taken young Timothy with them to hear Paul preach about the God who did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven, fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with goodness and gladness. And as Paul and Barnabas would have continued to preach, eventually they would have gotten to the point where they would have told the crowds that this Creator God is the Father who sent His Son, who died on the cross, and who has now sent the Holy Spirit to work faith in your hearts. We know how the good news was not though. St. Luke tells us. The good news that Paul preached that day in Lystra was met with anger and hate. For the Jews from Antioch and Iconium had heard that Paul and Barnabas were in Lystra, and so they came to persuade the crowds not to listen to Paul and Barnabas, but instead to stone them. To drag Paul out of the city and leave him for death. Paul rose. Paul rose. And he and Barnabas continued to preach the good news. And we know, as Paul tells us, Timothy and Lois and Eunice become believers in the God of the living and of the dead, the Savior of mankind, Christ Jesus. I'm sure Timothy had seen courage before, one way or another. This was a courage that I'm sure Timothy had never really seen. Here was a man who was willing to give everything up, to travel the world, to share with Jews and Gentiles alike the love of Jesus, to remain steadfast in the face of stoning. I'm sure Paul then went on to remind Timothy when he goes ahead and later on, as Timothy grows in wisdom and stature and strength, then Paul leaves Timothy behind in the congregation at Ephesus to be her pastor and her bishop, that he needed to remain steadfast, to remember that they first persecuted Jesus before they were going to persecute Timothy. In this world, young Timothy, friends, classmates, plenty of people in the community, and even folks in your own family will cause you tribulation. But I'm sure Paul reminded Timothy of the words of Jesus from John 16. Jesus has overcome the world. No doubt it couldn't have been easy for Lois and Eunice. Not only were they surrounded by an unbelieving world and the culture that they were in, even in their own home was a husband and a father who didn't believe in Jesus. Their prayers for Timothy and this man were not without tears, without anxiety, without hope. Praying Jesus 
They knew only could salvation be found. And thanks be to God, Timothy remains steadfast in the faith. He continues to grow in the faith of Jesus that his mother and his grandmother had passed on to him. Becoming that pastor in Ephesus. Finally, as the ancient writings tell us, reaching 80 years old. I still have 38 years to go. It says, Timothy once tied to stop a procession in the streets. A procession that the pagans were giving to Diana. He didn't try to stop them by force, but he tried to stop them with the preaching of the gospel. Tradition tells us that the angry pagans beat Timothy. They dragged him through the streets. And eventually they stoned him to death. Dear parents, grandparents, godparents, faithful in Christ, the world has changed a lot since 48 AD in Lystra. But it is very much the same. Our believing children and grandchildren are in the minority. Very much in the minority in our world today. The enticements to follow after other gods and believe in other things, even if one calls themselves a religious nun, is strong. And bringing them to the divine service in Sunday school on Sunday mornings and confirmation is great. It's a good beginning. But the liturgy of faith does not stop when we step outside those doors. Through tens of thousands of daily interactions with the people that we encounter on our daily life, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and sisters and brothers orient young and old hearts toward a vision of what the good life is. We show them what love is, what to desire, what matters most. By example, by practice, by how we talk, we say to our kids, we say to our co-workers, to our friends, this is the good life, the fulfilling life. The life that I have is the life worth living. In other words, we teach our children and those around us what or who to love in, to trust in, to rely upon, to find fulfillment in this world. And that who, or that what, becomes their God. So what religion have you chosen for yourself, for your family, and for your friends? Is it for them to strive for the next big thing? Getting into the University of Michigan or Michigan State, gotta cover both bases here now. Is it that you make this much money to make sure that when your retirement comes, you're going to be well taken care of? Is it to make sure that you have the nicest house on the block, the most manicured lawn? Is it to make sure that your kids or your grandkids know that sports is the end all, be all, until they blow out of me? And the scholarship to Michigan goes out the door. 
Or perhaps it's I faith. It's the faith of saying something new. This is the one that we live in more so today. It's believing something new. It's breaking religious barriers. It's rewriting the creeds and moving beyond the dead doctrines of dead people expressed in dead rituals. Whatever faith you embrace, we teach those around us to trust that they will be filled, fulfilled, in the what or who of their religion. We need to stop pretending then. The coming to church for an hour on Sunday morning, and bringing our kids to confirmation for an hour once a week on Wednesday nights is ever going to be enough. Parents, grandparents, I hate to tell you, you're the ones who choose your kids' religions. If we come to church and then spend the other six and a half days around the altar of materialism and memorizing the parts of the high faith, you don't have to be a prophet to know what religion your children most likely will follow after. Repent. You fail. And I fail as their pastor. But don't be ashamed for your failures. Every single person sitting in this room this morning has failed someone at some time. Don't be ashamed this year, as we get closer to the holiday season, to tell your kids or your grandkids that they are going to come to church with you on Thanksgiving and Christmas this year, and that it's a non-negotiable. Don't be ashamed to tell them again of the truth of the gospel, knowing that when they tell you to be quiet, I don't want to hear about your religion anymore. They told Jesus and Paul and Timothy to be quiet before you. And when they don't come with you or tell you to keep your Jesus nonsense to yourself, remember you're not alone. The other people in this room have all experienced that too. But take heart. Take heart. In the township of Chesterfield, your God has promised to come to you today in word and water and bread and wine. And he has forgiven you all your sins. He forgives you all your failures. He forgives you of those times where you have put other things before him. And he forgives you for those times when you did not speak up and say the truth. And he again today sets you on the narrow path of salvation. He dusts off your sins and your iniquities and your unrighteousness and she again shows you that you wear the gleaming robe of righteousness that he placed on you in baptism. That you are his. And he is yours. But Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother. He took on your flesh in the body of the Virgin Mary to unite themselves to failures. Jesus' ministry looked like a failure. It wasn't very big number of lives. The leaders that he gathered around him weren't very powerful or influential. And in the end, the leader of the group dies on a cross. 
We know that that's not the end. The Lord rises from the dead. And in his resurrection, Jesus gives life. By his death, Jesus forgives parents who taught their kids to trust more in wealth than they did to trust in him. He forgives godparents who have never talked to their godchildren about the faith. He forgives grandmas and grandpas who give into the grandkids' tantrums on Sunday morning when they don't want to go to church. And it's easier to stay home than to put them in the car and bring them here. He forgives us who are too ashamed to speak the truth of the gospel because we're afraid of what might happen to us. And so the Lord gives you second, and third, and fourth, and seventy-seventh, and seven hundred, seven hundred, seven thousand, seven hundred and seventy-seven more chances to share the word of God in word, in both word and in deed. Let us do so in love, in passion, in patience. Show them that the robe of righteousness doesn't get hung on a hook by the back door of the church when you leave this morning, only to be picked up next Sunday when you walk back in here, but that you wear it every day of your life for every moment. Let them see your Savior's love when you ask them for your forgiveness as you have failed them. And as you forgive them for walking away from Jesus. For who knows? Maybe then the Holy Spirit will change a hardened heart. Believe it. For Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and protect your heart and mind in true faith, the life everlasting. Amen. I now invite you to please rise and join with me as we continue our service with the prayers of the church. <coughs> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a love of God's word, that we might keep his testimonies, rejoice in his promises, and know his peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for pastors whom God has called to a holy calling, that he would embolden them in their testimony concerning our Lord Jesus, and strengthen them by his power to courageously suffer for the gospel, and guard the good deposit entrusted to them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for parents and grandparents, but as Lois and Eunice taught the faith to Timothy, they also would be diligent in teaching their children of Christ Jesus and of his salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for those who govern, that God would strengthen them to act with wisdom, so that we might be preserved from paralyzed law and perverted justice. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the people in Florida, Georgia and North and South Carolina, and all throughout the Caribbean, that the Lord of the Church would give strength and peace to those people who have not only lost homes and businesses, but also who have lost friends and loved ones to the great storm, that the Lord of the Church would send members of his body into that place to bring grace mercy, and peace to those who are hurting at this time, 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer from violence, strife, illness, or affliction, especially Joe, Keith, Gary, Vic, Larry, Jeff, Lillian, Joe, Vicki, Peggy, Jennifer, Kathy, and Lori, that the Lord who would heal and deliver them, and as they await the Lord's timing, strengthen them to live by faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For penitent hearts, the God who forgives our unworthiness and failures and clothes us in Christ's righteousness and his suffering, would make us ever grateful to receive the body and blood of the one who went to the cross as the suffering servant for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Receive our thanks for the callings you've given to us. Grant that we might rejoice to labor in service to you until you gather us to your banquet table in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
In these last days, you have poured out your Holy Spirit on your church, that your sons and daughters might proclaim the wonders of your salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon your gathered people, that faithfully eating and drinking the body and blood of your Son, we may go forth to proclaim his salvation to the ends of the earth. Hear us as we pray in his name, and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
greeting for the body of Christ. Given greeting for the Lord Jesus Christ. Body of Christ.
and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We join in our closing hymn. Things to bring to your attention for the coming weeks. Um, just a reminder: we continue to make our way through the screw tape letters in Bible class. Um, we're going to continue our discussion about prayer this morning, and then we're going to be moving into um, the next screw tape letter after that. So please come and join us. Also, Thursdays at noon we have Brown Bank Bible Study, as we are now in chapter eleven of Revelation. So come and bring your lunch or a snack, or well, you don't have to bring anything at all if you really don't want, uh, but you can come and join us uh, Thursdays at noon here at church. 
And then that evening, the Advent tea is going to be having a meeting um, at 6 o'clock or 6.30 here at church um, that evening as well. Also, just a reminder, next week, Sarah and I will be gone for a few days. Um, so if there is anything that you need or if there's an emergency that you have, we'll need to get out of the elders um, because I will be several hours away and will not be able to get to you very quickly. Um, and then if there's something else that needs to be done or something that I need to know of, I'm sure the elders will try and get a hold of me one way or another. Maybe with smoke signals or who knows what they'll do. I'm sure Keith would think of something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That might work too. So anyways, please keep that in, in mind as well. So next week, we also won't be having brown bag Bible study that day. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention that is in the bulletin is the fact that we've got some other new resources that are here at church for you to use. Um, a number of them are back in the track rack here in this part of the Natifex. Um, there's some wonderful resources that CPH has just come out with recently. Um, and want to make available to you as well. And then also we have three new children's books, cool little board books based on some of the hymns uh, that we sing very often here at church that are downstairs. So for example, if you brought those little grandchildren or maybe like nieces and nephews and you're needing to keep them a little bit busy, you can always grab them off of one of the shelves downstairs and you can sing with them or read with them here church so we're always trying to make sure that we not only take care of those of us who are a little bit more mature in the faith but especially those who are new in the faith um, which brings me a wonderful piece of news we'll be having a baptism on reformation sunday um, so keep that in mind as well as we praise god for a new life that he is bringing into his family by the waters of holy baptism so that's only a few sundays away is there anything else we heard? Nothing? Okay. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.